Today is Monday, August 13th, 2018, and my name is Scott Henshaw. I am in the Alumni House with Joe Lymanstall, Professor of Interior Architecture, to conduct an oral history interview for the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'd like to start off the interview by asking you about your background. Can you tell me when and where you were born? I was born on the eastern shore of Maryland in September 9th, 1951. Uh, I lived right on the mainland across from Assateague Island as a young child. Wow. And can you tell me about your family and home life? Sure. I'm one of three children. I'm the middle child. Uh, I have an older sister, Nancy, and a younger brother, Doug. And what did your parents do? My mom was a homemaker, and my father was uh, worked in the poultry industry um, as uh, sort of a regional salesperson. But he always told us to tell our friends that he was a chicken farmer. <laughs> <laughs> and what high school did you attend? Uh, we moved to Greenville, North Carolina when I started high school, and I went to J.H. Rose High School in Greenville. And did you have any favorite subjects? Uh, art was always a favorite subject of mine, and I also uh, dearly loved English. Okay, and what college or colleges did you go to? I went to UNC Chapel Hill for undergrad. I got a BFA in studio art with a minor in art history. Then yeah. I attended North right. Carolina State University uh, School of Design to get a Master of Architecture degree. Okay, and did you go straight from undergrad to grad? I did. Okay. Yes, my uh, senior year at Chapel Hill, I was in a seminar um, that Bob Stipe came and spoke at, oh, and yeah. he was talking about preservation and about architecture, and all of a sudden it clicked for me oh, really? that that's, that was what I wanted to do. I went and talked to him, and he suggested I go over and talk to Bob Burns at the School of Design, and I applied to start their Master of Architecture program. Okay. And so you were thinking about preservation early on, right? I was, especially, I was very uh, drawn to historic buildings, and I think Stipe's talk that, that day that I heard, um, because he was a, a very prominent preservationist, was focused on that. Mm -hmm. And it sort of made sense to me how to take my interest in art and tie it to ways that I was working with people and helping with community. Okay. And so, uh, you got your degree from state, NC State, and then what did you do? Um, after that, I uh, went to work with the State Historic Sites uh, Department, which is part of the Department of Cultural Resources, and um, worked under John Kinney, an architect in that office, uh, working on restoration projects at the various state historic sites across the state. Um, that was my first job out of school was I was working to get licensed as an architect. Um, then I applied and was accepted for um, an architectural conservation class that the International Center for the Conservation of Monuments offered every year in Rome. And once I got accepted for that, it was a six-month program. I left sites to work for six months helping to set up uh, a neighborhood housing um, services program in Durham. Mm -hmm. When I finished with the um, conservation class, North Carolina had just been chosen as one of the first uh, Main Street states mm -hmm. for the national program, and I applied to be the, the architect for that and was hired for that. So I came back and started working with Main Street. Okay. And so when did you start thinking about a career as an academic as opposed to doing preservation? frontline preservation activities? I think um, in my younger years, uh, being a teacher was always very strongly encouraged um, for girls at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I was not really thinking about that until I got contacted by John Alt, whom I had gone to grad school with. And he was a professor here at UNCG in the Department of Housing and Interior Design. And he contacted me because they were um, conducting a search for a new faculty member and had a strong interest in bringing in someone who could help them develop a preservation focus for um, a proposed grad program. And so um, that led me to apply 
to, okay. to UNCG. And what year was that that you applied? And um, got the job? I started teaching in fall of 1983, so it would have been um, the year before that I applied. Right. Okay. And so, did you know much about UNCG before you got here? Had you, you had my older sister had gone to UNCG, oh, really? so I had okay. been here a few times. Um, uh, I didn't know a lot about it, I, and I certainly didn't know much about teaching at the college <laughs> level when I first came. So, All right. so what were your first impressions then? Uh, I thought it was a lovely campus. Um, it it seemed very traditional in a lot of ways, but a lot of focus on the arts, um, which seemed like a good thing. Um, we were that the department was part of. Um, the home ec school at that time, which mm -hmm. has since evolved, um, uh, and we're now part of the college. Um, but it seemed very much a, a women's college at that point. Right. So, um, what was your first year teaching like? Um, it was pretty intense uh, because I'd never taught before, and um, trying to figure out how to teach design studios uh, and to come up with projects was um, exciting, but also a little intimidating. Um, also, my first lecture class was Structures and Materials, and mm -hmm. so I was barely staying ahead of the students <laughs> in terms of following the textbook on that one. Um, right. But I liked it very much from the beginning. Mm -hmm. so. Can you describe the Department of Housing and, and Interior Design, which I think is what it was called then, right? It's now the Interior Architecture Department. Uh, what was it like when you arrived? Uh, how many professors and what kind of majors and courses? Um, we did not have a graduate program at, at that point, only an undergraduate, and it was a five-year undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jan MacArthur was the chair at that time. I believe there were eight faculty. Um, I was trying to count back uh, here, including me. And I was one of two new faculty. Um, that were hired in 1983. The other was Jerry Limonstall, and two years later we were married. Uh -huh. Who knew I was going to find a husband here at UNCG? <laughs> yeah, that's a good deal, right? Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit about the students, what they were like in the 80s, and maybe, if, maybe there's no changes, but have there been any changes in the types of students that you've seen? Um, we've always been uh, a very studio-based department mm -hmm. and uh, had students that were very creative. Uh, we still do. What I find is the biggest difference from students in the 80s seem to be coming directly from high school to college. And um, so they were a little younger and uh, they often had not done a lot of travel or had other opportunities before mm -hmm. they came here. Um, Today, I would say our our department is students are very diverse in terms of age, in terms of race, in terms of gender, and that was not so much the case in the early mid '80s um, as it is today. And the other big difference is that our students all seem to be juggling a couple of jobs, you know, just a lot of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So they don't seem to have the um, the free time or the flexibility that students in the mid 80s did. Right. And and what kind of departmental changes have you seen over, <laughs> over time? There's been a lot of changes. We've changed our name. Um, we, uh, we're now interior architecture. We went from housing and interior design um, uh, to interior design and then changed it to interior architecture. Um, I would say we've always been uh, a, a good team-based sort of faculty in that we collaborate a lot. Um, we always have retreats before uh, each uh, semester, and um, we've always had folks with very different backgrounds. So uh, we've had architects, landscape architects, interior designers, um, and um, I would say the curriculum has stayed very much the same in terms of what we try to cover. But as the number of hours have shrunk in terms mm -hmm. of how many hours we can require for our degree, um, we've really had to be um, thoughtful about how to cover the things we think are essential um, in fewer hours than right. we did originally. Yeah, that's a challenge. So what has the department done to ensure the success of graduates? Uh, I would say we have a very strong track record uh, in this state. Uh, for our program, and that's that's been long-standing, and we are the only program that also offers an MFA, um, and we've 
been um, accredited by CETA, which is our the accreditation association mm -hmm. for interior design and interior architecture programs for many years, um, and we uh, are coming up for our next review for that this coming year, but we work hard to make sure our students are um, getting um, the kind of education we feel like is important. We um, now you're going to have to remind me, what, what, where do we start with this question? <laughs> uh, I was asking uh, what the department does to ensure the success of its graduates. Uh, I think we have a pretty strong network of alums. Uh, all of our students do internships and that's often a good way to get your mm -hmm. foot in the door. Um, and uh, I think we have a strong reputation because we've been established for so long. Right. And can you give us uh, kind of an idea of the kinds of careers that graduates follow? Sure. Many of our undergraduates go to work for design firms, often design firms that have both architecture and interiors as part of the services they provide. Um, a whole range of folks who do residential or commercial or preservation related um, firms. Uh, some of our graduates of the MFA uh, or even before we had the MFA, we had the MS, are educators. We have, I think, four teaching at High Point University now that are alums of our program, um, two at Forsyth Tech, and um, others who are, you know, in programs in other states. Um, so we have educators as well as practitioners. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, Historic preservation has been an area of interest for you for a long time, as you said. It has. And you've been very active in making that happen on several levels. Uh, could you talk about why it's so important to you? Sure. To me, sense of place is really important to, to human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, in particular, I think it's, it's just really essential to have a sense of identification and orientation that the historic build environment provides us. It, it really gives us that sense of place. It helps us if we know where we're coming from to know where we're going. And to me, it's part of how we can have more balanced lives. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how has teaching changed over your career, or has it? Uh, teaching has changed. Um, the way it's changed primarily, in my opinion, is the technology mm -hmm. and the way we teach. Uh, certainly, back in the day, I had thousands of slides and use right. a slide projector and uh, switching to far more digital uh, assignments and PowerPoint and all of those has been a big change. But also for interior architecture, the digital technology for drafting, for generating perspective views, three-dimensional models, those kinds of things has changed in, in huge ways mm -hmm. since I first started teaching when we were still mainly just drawing by hand. Right, um, so in 1983 there were really right. no commuter, computer labs for... No, you know. I can still remember getting my first little Mac Plus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, things like email, all of those kinds of things, you know, right. are since then. Uh, but the, I would say the, the shift in digital technology, it has been, had a huge impact on interior architecture, I'm sure on many other programs as well, but because we're so visual, mm -hmm. um, it's, and because it has pretty much replaced um, doing much hand drafting, we still teach that, we still want students to be able to generate and sketch, um, but their final projects uh, typically are very much generated on mm -hmm. the computer. So, speaking of preservation, on campus the uh, McKeever building was just demolished. Do you have any fond memories of it, or are you <laughs> glad to see it gone? I have fond memories of getting lost in it a few yeah. times. I remember someone describing it as a rabbit warren. Um, but it was very much a piece of its era, and um, I appreciated it for that. Uh, I think if we'd waited a lot longer to see it demolished, there might have been protests about <laughs> that it it had um, it had historic significance. Mm -hmm. um, but it it didn't function well, uh, and I I think we're better off without it. Yeah, it's just strange now to walk by it and not be there. Um, would you like to comment on the state of historic pres preservation on UNCG's campus in general? Um, I think there have been some very interesting decisions made 
at UNCG uh, over my time here. Um, one that, uh, and in the two instances I want to mention, mm -hmm. I think both times UNCG got on board with preserving part of our campus because of community and alum concerns, and certainly our department was involved with that as well. Um, one of my favorites is the challenge of demolishing the Chancellor's House on campus, which ultimately was um, uh, resolved by relocating it down Spring Garden Street. Um, but that certainly um, took a lot of lobbying mm -hmm. and a lot of um, uh, politicking to get the university to see that as a better decision than demolishing it. Mm -hmm. And a little, a few years later, I remember when there was a lot of discussion about the quad and um, uh, the, the idea that those buildings might be demolished, or at least some of them might be, and just enormous response from alums who saw that as so much their sense of place for UNCG mm -hmm. and had such strong memories of it um, that, in fact, the quad was more or less saved and um, adapted to, to meet uh, more current housing needs. Um, but I, that, to me, was an example where, once again, community and alums really made a huge difference in the direction UNCG was going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it also speaks to what you're talking about with sense of place, that um, they have real connections with these places, so it's important to them. Right. Yeah. Uh, is there any particular research or coursework or projects of which you're particularly proud? Um, I would say in terms of my own research, uh, something I'm enormously proud of is my research on Thomas Day, mm -hmm. who was a free black cabinet maker and woodworker before the Civil War, and in fact in the 1850 census owned the largest woodworking shop in the entire state. Um, he, his shop was in Milton, North Carolina, and I got involved because um, I was selected as the architect for the restoration of the Thomas Day House after a fire back in, had damaged it significantly back in 1989. And in working on that project, I got very interested in Day's um, work and his impact, particularly on Caswell County. Um, mm -hmm. And um, eventually that led to me beginning to do research on his woodwork. Um, my co-author on the book uh, on Thomas Day, Pat Phillips Marshall, was already an expert on his furniture mm -hmm. and she worked with the Museum of History in Raleigh and they have the largest collection of his furniture but there was far less known about his woodwork and the impact of his woodwork. It was sort of assumed for a long time that he had only done woodwork on occasion for patrons, you know, clients who he was doing furniture for. And over 15 years of knocking on doors and saying, you don't know me, but I'm a UNCG professor and I'd like to look at your woodwork, um, I eventually identified 80 buildings that I believe uh, incorporated, ha had Thomas Day woodwork in them. And um, that was really exciting to me. And uh, I also have to say, without digital photography, there's no, you know, it, just thinking of the hundreds of shots I took every, every time I'd get into a building, right. that was a huge part of the research for it. Right. Um, so that's, that's something I'm very proud of. Um, I was excited that in addition to a huge exhibit on Thomas Day at the Museum of History when the book came out back in 2010, um, I got to give a lecture at the Renwick Museum in, um, Washington, D.C., because they followed up with an exhibit of his work um, a few years later. Awesome. Anything else you want to talk about in that area? Um, I would say um, other things that I'm very proud of are um, the fact that I've worked with 22 communities on design guidelines for the historic districts. Most of those are here in the state, you know. Um, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, Salisbury, Statesville, um, uh, and I, that's something I have a lot of passion for because it's important to me to help um, communities, neighborhoods understand w why their neighborhood is special and also understand how to preserve that character. So um, the last ones I did were just a year ago for High Point. Mm -hmm. and, and I did that with actually one of my former students who I hope is going to take up the design guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, queen crown uh, from me, uh, Heather Wagner. So, awesome. Yeah. 
Um, and then I would just say too that I am thrilled that in 2016 um, the Department of Commerce invited um, our department with me in the leadership role to begin providing design assistance for the North Carolina Main Street program. Mm -hmm. um, and that, of course, was something coming full circle from one of my first jobs to now uh, working with students who are learning how, how to think about storefront rehab and upper story apartments. And there are something like 93 Main Street communities in North Carolina, and um, we mm -hmm. map every one of our design proposals. Uh, we've done over a hundred facade schemes now and um, 10 upper story apartment schemes and it's very exciting to see the opportunity for the students and the impact we're making on mm -hmm. the state. That's great. Anything else? Well I would say that of course following this passion for preservation the fact that we uh, collaborated with the Department of History uh, way back when Bill Link was chair and uh, I worked with Lisa Tolbert as well to develop um, graduate specializations. Uh, we called them concentrations at that time in historic preservation and museum studies. Now history handles museum studies and we handle preservation as a specialization and also offer a certificate in it. And um, we're the only grad program in the state that offers a certificate in preservation and there's a huge legacy of alums of our uh, graduate program and our certificate program working in preservation um, mm. in the state and beyond. Okay. Great. Do you have any particular recollections of colleagues that you'd like to share with us? Well, I'd have to say first and foremost the fact that um, Jerry Limestall began as a colleague and now we've uh, shared over 30 years of marriage and raised two amazing children is first and foremost. He was also the first one he had taught for several years before coming here and was a great coach that first year as I was trying to figure out how to deal with teaching and situations that came up with students. Um, but in addition to Jerry, um, Patrick Lucas was here for a good decade of my time here at UNCG and was just a fantastic colleague who shared my interest in preservation and uh, public history and material culture. And uh, uh, that, that was truly a gift to be able to work with him. And um, my other very favorite was our department secretary for years and years was Sally Shelton and um, she just uh, I think this is back in the day I don't know if it's still true but it used to be the secretary really knew what yes. was going on and Sally kept us all straight and um, was a wealth of advice on life and teaching and uh, anything else that would come up and so um, I have many fond memories of her. She also taught me a lot of Southern sayings, like she'd want to pinch his head off, or yeah, you know, yeah. uh, uh, I'm a fixin' to, or whatever. Sure. And um, she just really uh, was the heart of our program for many years. Awesome. Well, we're coming to the conclusions portion. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you, can you tell me how UNCG has affected your life and what it means to you? Well, having I guess this is my 35th year, I believe, I'll be teaching. Uh, if my math is correct, uh, it's had a huge impact on my life. And what I appreciate most about um, my time here is that if you had an idea and you were willing to put the time and effort into it, um, there was always support for that. And I feel like I've been able to grow tremendously um, through the opportunities that I've been allowed to, to uh, take on here at UNCG. Uh, and I also like the fact that we're very tied to this community and I've been able to, um, you know, chair the Preservation Greensboro Board, the Preservation North Carolina Board, you know, serve on the, uh, chair the Greensboro Preservation Commission and uh, serve on the Guilford County one and, you know, many opportunities like that where I feel like um, what I could bring to the table was really helpful to the community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, it has been, uh, a wonderful place to work in terms of the support I've gotten for uh, initiatives that I wanted to take on. Yeah. So we're doing these interviews as part of the 125th anniversary of the university and one of the things we're asking people is kind of a fun question is where do you see the university going in like the next 25 or 30 years? I hope that we will 
continue to do or do more and more community engaged work. I feel like that's a great direction uh, that certainly our department's been doing for a while, but I see many others taking on as well. And I think it's it's a great way to have visibility for the university, but also to give back to the community. So I hope that will just continue to blossom. Um, and I hope that we won't lose sight of our long-standing support of the creative arts. Mm -hmm. I think that's been a, a part of who UNCG is um, for uh, decades, maybe 125 years, and um, I would love to see that continue to flourish. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I don't have any more formal questions for you. Is there anything else you'd like to add or talk about? I think we've pretty much covered it. Okay. Great. Thank you so Thank much you for talking Scott. with us.